friends of Australia, friends of Papua New Guinea, friends and family. As Chancellor of the Australian National University, I am so honoured to welcome to our campus my friend, colleague, brother, James Marape and Madame Marape, and his most distinguished delegation from Papua New Guinea, Australia's closest neighbour and dearest friend. May I commence proceedings by acknowledging and celebrating the Ngambri Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners on whose lands we meet this evening and pay respects to elders past and present. Prime Minister Marape, among the very special guests here this evening who have gathered to hear you speak, we have our Minister, Pat Conroy, our High Commissioners from Australia and PNG, your very distinguished delegation, which includes ministers and provincial governors and statesmen and other people from PNG who are so deeply connected with Australia. We have our new Vice-Chancellor, distinguished Professor Genevieve Bell, whom you've just met, and at least 11 members of the ANU Council who are here this evening. Uh, we have staff and students, and I particularly wanted to mention that in the audience this evening are a number of students from Papua New Guinea, some who are attending the ANU UPNG summer school and others who are studying at the Crawford School. But that is to give you a sense of the ongoing deep ties between the Australian National University and the University of PNG, your alma mater. And I'm always delighted by this fun fact that ANU was the first university in the world beyond UPNG to teach Trok Pisan as part of our language school. In fact, when my niece spent 12 months living in PNG and she worked for um, Book Belong Pikinini, I was always so delighted to hear her speak Tok Pisan throughout our family gatherings. Prime Minister, you have given a number of speeches since your arrival here in Australia, and the Vice Chancellor and I were privileged to hear you speak last evening, and I know you gave a brilliant speech to the Australian Parliament today, and you are in fact the first leader from Papua New Guinea to deliver an address to the Australian Parliament. And our shared history and our shared future is to be treasured. Prime Minister, we very much look forward to your words this evening. Please come and deliver your special address. Prime Minister James Marape. Well, thank you, uh, Chancellor of the Australian National University, the Honourable Julie Bisoff. She speaks so eloquent, and sometimes I wish uh, I can have a little bit of that skills. Uh, but in any case, I, I, I must proceed. Let me acknowledge the head of the Crawford School of Development Studies, Vice Chancellor. Sorry, I missed you in the in the, in the order of acknowledgement. Thank you very much. It was kind to uh, uh, meet me outside, and I was presented a book that was the last, last that it came out in the sunlight was 1984. And I signed on that book, and it's a very uh, a trace of the university had distinguished sicknesses inside. 1984, I was doing grade seven up in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. I hardly could connect two English lines. There's a punchline in 1984. So thank you, Vice Chancellor, for bringing this book out. I want to acknowledge the scholars here at ANU. Thank you very much, and the students for coming by, the people of Australia, the diaspora, PNG diaspora here in, in, in Australia, all distinguished guests, my delegation, ministers of state who are here, uh, and uh, from both sides, I include Senator 
uh, Pat as uh, my delegation because I don't think he's always here at the university. <laughs> uh, so he had to tag along when we came by. But uh, the entire team from the parliament at Canberra, we're happy to be here this afternoon to at least uh, speak a little bit deeper than what we had, uh, had conversed uh, last night and also at the parliament house today. And so thank you, uh, Chancellor, my friend Julie, for ensuring that this moment of conversation is, is, uh, is, is made for me to speak deep in some issues that I feel the National University here must uh, hear and see from the context of where we are in as far as PNG Australia relationship is concerned, but more importantly, from the context of PNG leadership. It will be unfair of me not to acknowledge the uh, uh, Nanawal and the Nambri people. Thank you very much for their continued hospitality to all of us, the past, present, and future. We acknowledge their continued uh, support in spirit to ensure uh, all of us are gathered here. Australia National University uh, has a proud and long history, and that history is closely associated with uh, Papua New Guinea. I'm an alma mater of the University of Papua New Guinea, and we, in our own school, know very much the role the Australian National University has continued to play and provide. And I want to say, as a former UPNG student, and possibly a student again in the not too distant future, I want to say thank you very much for the role ANU has played in partnering the premier University of Papua New Guinea. Thank you, ANU. The partnership between ANU and UPNG existed prior to independence and has continued up till this point in time. Various formal and informal uh, arrangements have been made between various faculties as well as schools and countless academic studies and exchanges has been going on and this has run successfully year in year out for the last six decades. Recently ANU and UPNG entered into formal arrangements between the ANU Crawford School. And uh, today, I gather the Crawford School is hosting this event uh, with the UPNG School of Business and Public Policy and the exchange that continues to run between ANU Department of Pacific Affairs and UPNG School of Humanities and Social Sciences through the Pacific Research Program. And I want to appreciate not just today's program, but the depth of data history and, and, and everything that you have collated since we, you started program with UPNG six decades ago. These arrangements will ensure that practical collaboration between our two schools, both eminent, uh, ANU very eminent in not just Australia, but the entire Pacific and the region, as well as your own global uh, reputation, and also your continued help to our University of Papua New Guinea. And I want to say thank you again. Your uh, annual economic surveys, for instance, your election database, for instance, if you think we don't read your data and statistics as a politician, I have deep interest in additional <laughs> credible statistics from outside who have no interest in local politics, but more importantly, facts that are coming through. So thank you very much for all those, all those data that come through. Your budget assessments, your research on the Pacific portal, research portal, and every other programs that ANU has collaborated with local researchers, UPNG, our NRI, and our own uh, various government departments. I just want to appreciate the collaboration that has been going on for some time. You, perhaps in your research ability, know about Papua New Guinea better than myself. Uh, but in any case, let me give you some uh, refresher. A uh, nation today possibly is a nation of 10 million people, my note says. I would assume it's 12 million. Later this year, we're doing a full in-depth uh, census. I have the ministers assisting me, uh, Minister Treasury, Minister Planning uh, in the House, Minister Foreign Affairs. Uh, they will not me to retire our long outstanding census this year. We will establish exactly what our population is, but key statistics nonetheless remain the same. Our nation is the most diverse nation on planet Earth. Stephanie, you know that. Very diverse nation. Over 800 languages. All of them have their own tribal cultural setup and structure, their own local governance structures, their own cultural expectations and worldview. 
And so to fuse them into a modern, uh, modern nation has never been an easy task. But we've managed to hold forth as a robust democracy 49 years on. In that diversity, we also have, apart from ethno-linguistic diversity, we have biodiversity. Both our terrestrial ecosystem as well as marine ecosystem is second to none. We believe we have 7% of world's known biodiversity, so you would assume our per capita biodiversity is second to none on the face of planet Earth. So to, to the ethno-cultural diversity as well as biodiversity, Senator Conroy, second to none. You're investing in the right place. We are investing in the right place. And so sit on top of this one, we are straddled in between an exciting part of planet Earth. It is peaceful right now, and we'd like to maintain peace forever. When you look in the context of global uh, conversations, there can be no better place to live than our Pacific, uh, Pacific habitat. But PNG straddles in between Indo-Asia as well as the Pacific. And we find ourselves in this place, and we take our place seriously, and we take the opportunities that come with it also seriously. And so I'd like to say, uh, in the context of where we place, uh, uh, where we are straddled, uh, we take our responsibility as a democracy very seriously to ensure we remain uh, an active buffer in the presence of the confluence of many interests, confluence of commerce, confluence of trade, confluence of uh, uh, a world that is increasingly socializing on the platform of social media, and now the emergence of artificial intelligence gives us more uh, concern, as well as opportunities for us to harness and capitalize on. But the backdrop to where PNG is today has never been easy. I spoke at the parliament, and last night I also spoke lightly, that we started off from a very awkward place. In 1975, our economy was under Five billion, and I'm, I run the risk of being appraised by you academy, academians. You do your research, I may be wrong. You do your research, and I speak in total confidence that you will be researching my statistics. Mm -hmm. And so 1975, we were an economy under five billion kina. At today's value, US dollar or Australia, uh, Australian dollar for that matter, easily we were still under one billion dollar. And so that is the place we started off from. Our land mass, I spoke at Parliament today, bigger than UK, bigger than Japan, bigger than New Zealand, to give you some context. In that big land mass, we're not as flat as what you have in UK. For those who visit UK, we have high mountains, tropical mountains, as well as sub-alpine snow-capped mountain in the highest peak in Mount William. We have swamps, we have valleys, we have big rivers. We have islands and we have atolls. Islands and atolls number over 600 of them, much bigger than the entire Pacific Island group of nations put together. 20 of my islands, if not 30 of them, are bigger than the islands of the Pacific Island nations, so to speak. So we're not a small island state. We are a big island country. The challenges in PNG has always been big. From a five billion Kina uh, economic base, Consistently in the last 44 years before we took office, it has grown somewhat at a small snail pace up to 79 billion, 80 billion Kina thereabouts. I want to say thank you very much at this juncture to the help we have continued to re receive from all the Australian governments and administrations since 1975. Australia has never sighed away or stayed away, uh, despite some of the down times we've had and They've always been with us every step of the way. Uh, every Papua New Guinean students and ministers visiting Papua New Guineans in the, in the house, step back with me and clap to all the Australians, please. <laughs> and so since then, we've, we've come. And when we took office, uh, my uh, compatriot, the Honorable Ian Ling Staki, knows the statistics better than I do. We were, 80, we were under 80 billion Kina in 2019. We were officially in recession in 2018. We had a negative 3% recessed economy in 2018 when we took office. We went about restructuring, and we were in the business of uh, getting the economy up and running. But COVID-19 descended on not just us, but every one of us that had a global economy contraction that took place. 
But thankfully, we had good friends, Australia included, that assisted our economy, uh, and we went into a deliberate deficit budget plan to make sure sufficient liquidity is flowing into the economy using government budget to stimulate growth and an expansionary focus we embarked upon. Four years on, that pathway is proving some success. We were not reckless. We brought in IMF into the fray. Uh, you know, not everyone are friends of IMF, but we have no choice but to ensure that what we're doing is transparent and independent referee must be in the room. And so we deliberately brought into the picture IMF that stood with us every step of the way to, to give credibility to the numbers that Ian was posting every now and then. And, uh, and since then, we have, when I look back in 2024, as of last year when we went to prepare for 2024 fiscal year, our treasurer pronounced a 111 billion Kenyan economy. That effectively means in the last four hard years, at least at the macroeconomy level, we were able to post over 30 billion Kenya growth in our macroeconomy space. That's something we've done, and I want to again say thank you to Australia, who have been an important part of us in our financing of a deficit budget space. You're able to come in, and we've been able to sustain right through. Today, I want to indicate to you, as Australian taxpayers, we're not reckless. IMF still remains in our economy and in our treasury. We're working on a fiscal consolidation pathway. Last year, we slashed our deficit by one billion kina. We're on a deficit slash continually. We hope to come back to a balanced budget if not earlier than by 2027. And thereon going forward, Trust Staki has announced a 13-year fiscal plan that is working towards debt elimination. Uh, if he's around, he will be aggressive. If I'm not around, I'll not be quite as aggressive. I will be plowing back to ensure we go into our infrastructure focus that we've been engaged upon. But in any case, we have a fiscal, clear fiscal pathway that runs into 2030s. In between now and then, we're working our major resource projects. We have Papua LNG that is uh, uh, almost there. We have Pasca LNG. We have uh, uh, Pinyang LNG. And for those who are anti-LNGs, I just want to tell you, Papua New Guinea is carbon negative. Our 462,840 square kilometers of land, 70% is forest cover. And so our sufficient forest cover ensures we are carbon negative. Currently, we emit only 10 million metric tons of CO2. Our absorption capacity is over 100 metric ton, million metric tons of CO2. We are carbon negative. So for those of you companies in Australia, if Australia is giving a hard time, bring your investment dollar into PNG. <laughs> you, have, you will be given an express lane with a green label, a green identity. But in any case, with these super projects lined up for us, by 2024 to 2038, we will have LNG construction industry running that will add to the construction dollar alone over $30 billion worth of construction activities in the LNG space. We will throw in on top a Wafi Golfu uh, gold mine project and something close to my heart, the new Pogra. Uh, many skeptics thought that the major investor, the second biggest mining company in the world, would shut its gate on PNG and run away. But thank goodness, Barrick Gold Corporation, the Barrick Gold Limited, decided to hang around under 49% equity arrangements to them and a 51% equity arrangements to the PNG party. And for investors here, we will not chase you away. We know your return on investment. We will benchmark against global benchmarks and a competitive benchmark you operate inside. You make a return on your side of investment. We will make a return on our side of investment. Pogra, the second biggest gold mining company in the world, Barrick, has shown that we can negotiate for a better outcome. They sit on a minority shareholding. We sit on a majority shareholding. We've learned from Bougainville to not to look after landowners and to learn not to look after uh, the local authorities is quite disastrous. So, I think the investors in PNG have seen that uh, they can do better deals with us, and we're moving into this, this space. This will ensure that we secure the economic fundamentals of our country. Our resource base is sufficient, and I want to give certainty to those of you through your tax dollars that support our budget. Uh, hopefully, this time, 10 years from today, we don't come knocking on you asking for 
uh, money to support our budget, but we're able to have enough resources so that you and me together contribute to keeping our part of planet Earth safe, secure from all, all manners of intrusion in as far as our democracy and our peace and serenity is concerned. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah. If PNC is strong economically, we assist you. If we're not strong, well, you keep on doing the, doing the support role in the entire region, and uh, it will be eventually stressful on yourself. And so it is in your shared interest that PNG grows to be economically strong. And are uh, we getting there? Last year, for instance, despite all these projects I mentioned not coming on board, through increasing systematic efficiency within ourselves, we were able to collect, or uh, we are focusing to collect over 23 point four billion kina in revenue this year. That is the highest ever level of revenue collections in our country. The last time I was finance minister, the revenue base was 13 billion kina. Uh, and it was not too far off. I was finance minister in 2018. The revenue base was 13 billion kina, 14 billion kina. Today, the revenue base this year will exceed 23 billion kina in, 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 in our terms. It is the highest ever. Uh, and that will be part of our 27 billion kina money plan for this year that the Treasurer handed down last year. In that, we have the highest ever parcel of investment to public infrastructure. Public infrastructure has been our focus simply because with key enabling infrastructures, we carry a modern economy and service delivery is much, much easier. So we have of that 27 billion kina, 10 billion kina parcel for our infrastructure plan in our country to ensure that government support to not just social sector, but more importantly, economic and key enabling infrastructures receive support and add to bolster our economy. I want to also indicate for those of you, because I speak to you as taxpayers, Papua New Guinea taxpayers and Australian taxpayers, and I am, I am, I am, I am uh, obliged to give you how we are spending our 27 billion kina budget, if it is worth your your attention. PNG is investing record amounts in the education sector, allocating 6.6 .6 billion in, in 2024, 8.3% uh, increase. On top of this one, we are uh, investing in additional health workers, 840 of them, to go into our, 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 our health, work, worker, uh, uh, health, health workforce. We also bring more teachers into the picture. We want to educate every child in PNG in the direct education pathway, as well as the alternate flexible pathway we've established in every child in PNG from now on must matriculate to year 12, so that they have an equal opportunity of 12 years of education to uh, place themselves in a place of uh, self-empowerment going forward. We aspire to have health services one hour within reach, whether it's by foot, by, by, by boat, by plane or by car, and we're working in this place. We're fixing Port Mosby, uh, General Hospital for the first time for chronic issues. Last week, Sunday, I visited our cancer facility that is being built. This time next year, no more will PNG export medical patients elsewhere. We will have state-of-art cancer facility, state-of-art health facility, state-of-art kidney facility. This time next year, we envisage, I'm being very bold, hold me to my word. This time next year, we envisage to do kidney transplant in Port Mosby General Hospital. I made a pledge when I took office that by 2025, we don't want to export medical patients. Today, I want to announce that we're receiving patients from Solomon Islands and other Pacific Island nations. They're coming to Port Mosby for heart and deep angiogram testings. Uh, it costs Papua New Guineans over 100,000 kina to go to Philippines, Singapore. Some come here. Uh, today, it just costs them 2,000 kina to get a full angiogram tested in Port Mosby. We're receiving patients from Solomon Islands and Fiji. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful facility coming up. And again, we all contribute to, to this one, so Australian taxpayers and PNG taxpayers. I just want to say thank you for this. We're investing heavily in the law and justice sector. 9.5% uh, of our money plan for 2024 goes to the law and justice sector. Today, before coming here, I visited a wonderful facility, and I saw the high highly skilled capacity of the Australian Federal Police in responding to, to really dangerous situations. And uh, uh, I, I jokingly made a passing remark. Uh, 
what I saw doesn't equate to my presentation in Parliament. And uh, I was happy I saw uh, police, uh, police uh, strength of the Australian Federal Police. We will be importing that. And as part of the uh, agreement we have with the Australian government, in as far as BCA is concerned, we intend to import law enforcement capacity up, uh, you know, up built and uplift back to Port Mosby. But locally on our own, 9.5% of our budget is geared towards law and justice sector support. Police receives greater support. We want to build our police to a 10,000 police force by 2032. When we took office, we had police of only 4,000 serving men in a nation of over 12 million people. That statistics and ratio is very imbalanced and we want to rectify this one. We've given assistance to the economy. We've lifted the non-tax paying threshold to 20,000. Pango Party is almost a leftist government. We're all about helping our people. And so uh, uh, possibly quite similar to the Australian Labor government. And so we're trying our very best to lighten the burden of the ordinary. And we're looking at continuing in that space. But to our investors, we're also modeling on the best tax model that we could give so that our investors are not discouraged, but they have a certainty of uh, also sharing the workload and carrying the burden in a, in a, in a lightened manner. Uh, uh, Minister Starkey and the team at Treasury has been asked to relook at our taxation regime going forward. I want to speak a little bit on, uh, in, as far as uh, 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 something very close to my heart, I committed to Papua New Guinea in my inaugural speech on 30th of May 2019 that we will deliver independent commission against corruption. In 2020, December or November 11th, I almost lost government. November 10th, we passed the Independent Commission Against Corruption Bill. Today, three years on, we have two assistant commissioners, one from New Zealand, one from Australia, and a commissioner from Australia. Highly competent legal people who are running our ICAC. This is set up to ensure that we fight corruption. And for me, corruption is seen from the context of economic preservation and gain. There is no point me growing the economy if the basket remains with so much sinkholes or holes for the matter. And so ICAC is being set up, it's functional. We also have uh, created an increasing space for additional judiciaries. Uh, up till 2023, the cap of our judiciary remained at 60 in a nation of over 12 million litigious people. Uh, you just can't have, you just can't have uh, 40 or 60 judges. We've now lifted the ceiling to 200, and I spoke with your Prime Minister earlier today. I don't mind the entire money meant to support us in the law and justice sector. Just pay your judges, pay your police, pay your magistrates, pay your uh, anti-corruption commissioners, uh, get them up there and fill in my law and justice sector space. We need that independence, we need that robustness. We need uh, capacity uh, inbuilt into our law enforcement structure, the full full, uh, uh, full uh, law and justice sector intervention needs our help. And I'm happy to report to all of you in this presentation. Work in the law and justice sector is going on. It is not yet there. Uh, it will outlive me. The work will outlive me, but uh, I just uh, I, I want to wish that going forward, governments after me do not abandon the cause of strengthening the law and justice sector space, including the support to the anti-corruption agencies that we have set up. I quickly, I know my time is running. Uh, I, I could see uh, my friend Julie trying to uh, stop me in, uh, in that in my, in my speech. Uh, she's got some questions, so I can respond to some of the questions, but I want to, uh, it will be, I know something close to your heart. You want to know where is PNG's place in the world? I spoke earlier on our, the fact that we straddle in the middle of Pacific and the Indo-Asia region. We do not take our place lightly. Our uh, democracy is entrenched, and we will work, continue to entrench our democracy. We choose our partnership, despite the overriding uh, foreign policy that my own party birthed at 1974, the friends to all, enemies to none, foreign policy uh, that we maintain, but we have specific aspects of each nation we relate with. And those are principle-based. Some we have economic relations, and some we have economic relations as well as uh, and uh, principle-based relationships, and uh, those peculiar envelope of relationship we have with every nation will be maintained within the context of how we want to build a nation going forward. 
Last year we saw, uh, we received and hosted many leaders who came to our shores. They were gracious to come, the leaders from Fiji, France, India, Indonesia, Hungary, uh, as well as the United States, uh, and of course, the Pacific Island leaders, including Australia and New Zealand. Those were visits that we received, and we know we will be receiving similar visits going forward. If you want to go to Asia, you pass through PNG. Whether you're going west or going north. If you want to go east to the Pacific, you pass through PNG. If you want to come south, uh, into deep south on planet Earth in Australia and New Zealand, you come to PNG. You cannot ignore the fact that we are straddled right in the heart of the exciting part of planet Earth. And uh, we will be so unless someone drag us away from here, but uh, if we are dragged away, then as I told Parliament today, Julie, we stuck at the hips. <laughs> the Australasian continental plate joins us at the hip. Half my country is, in fact, Australia in the Australian continent. This, the Australian continental plate is half the southern part of my country. The other five plates, plate tectonics, uh, constitute the highlands and the New Guinea Highlands. And so we stuck with you here forever. We're not going anywhere else. <laughs> and uh, I want to say that uh, our democracy will be preserved. Our union and our relationship is something we don't take for lightly, take for granted. Uh, we know our place in the world, and we know our place in the Pacific. In the, in the midst of many relationships, we will never compromise our democracy and our, our subscription to free economy, market economy, and the rule of common law for all. PNG continues to find membership in many global forums. We are active member of PIF. We are active member of uh, APEC. We are active member of the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States. We are member of the Melanesian Spirit Group. Uh, when, whenever our opinions are sought, we are transparent. We never play nations against each other. As a custom to Melanesians, we believe friends to all and enemies to none DNA is all about transparency and maintaining transparency in how we relate to each other and we don't play one against each other. We will maintain the sanctity of the union we have with its nations, but also uh, we will not capitalize on where we are placed to ensure that our relationship east, west, north, south is maintained in that context. Uh, if you ask my take on many, some of the issues that is coming up into the future, whilst Geopolitics remain a big issue. I still think poverty induced uh, induce uh, 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 trigger to uh, planet Earth will still remain a big challenge. Uh, there's substantial poverty in a region and elsewhere. With the poverty that is prevalent, it will force population to have a massive rush to harvest of natural resources. And with continuous threat on the climate change, uh, a poverty issue needs to be addressed by all public policy matters because everyday need forces people to run to what they can do for basic human survival. We saw that on the 10th of January in Port Mosby, in a small trigger that took place, everyday need cost certain part of our city to run to ransack stores within the precinct and neighborhood. So I just thought poverty will be a major issue for the have-nots on planet Earth. It's not just in our part of the world. Papua New Guinea and Australia is fortunate to have big land where our people, if properly engaged, could sustain themselves on the land and sea they, they relate to. But many parts of planet Earth, Africa, the Asian economies, and, and of course Europe, population uh, will put stress on resources and especially matters relating to land and, and, and agriculture. Climate change has been a big issue for every one of you in Australia. PNG Forest is there for you to partner. I point to you, PNG Forest. For every one of you looking for clean energy solutions, PNG's geothermal and hydro potential is there for you to tap into. We are only kilometers that separate us. Our waters run endlessly, endlessly into the Gulf of Papua. If Australia looks for cleaner energy options and alternate, Papua New Guinea offers you a massive river system south of PNG, south side of PNG, and directly north of you. These are possible solutions to your alternate energies, and we offer that to Australia in as far as the future is concerned. So I speak much on this one. I just want to give you our fullest assurance in summary. We're trying our very best to build a stronger economy. Building a stronger economy ensures our domestic security as well as regional security contribution 
is 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 uh, is uh, free flowing, and in the process, we hope to support Australia uh, in the upkeep of our region from what might happen into the future. Today, when I spoke at the Parliament, I said we must construct the future using the past as our tailwind. The future needs to be constructed today. I look forward to contribution from all of you. Your reports on our election uh, deficiencies are noted. We're working to have a better election and a reform are underway. And something my generation of leaders want to give to our country is a better election platform in 2027. Hopefully, uh, we add more women into the fray when we tidy ID-based voting platform in our country that will start with this year's census update. We have issues with Bougainville. Bougainville remains very much uh, 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 torn on the side. We love Bougainvillians. They're part of us. They voted for independence, a 97.7% vote for independence. Uh, but we're following the details and the spirit of the 2001 peace agreement. We're now coming to the last 10. That means parliament must have a handle on the vote that took place in Bougainville. And uh, we give every respect to our kinsmen and kinswomen in Bougainville. The 2001 peace agreement will be supported in its fullest and entirety, and Parliament will take custody of the result of the vote. And whatever it is, that will not be the end game. Bougainville and is part of Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea will be part of Bougainville, as we are part of Greater Melanesia. That relationship will remain, and we will work this through as Melanesian brothers and sisters does work. They voted for political independence. Our constitution at the moment doesn't allow one part of our country to be politically independent, and they know, we know, that the mountains are too high for the crossover. But we as brothers and sisters, we'll work it through. We don't intend for us to break the intention of the 2001 peace agreement. We have stepped in the right direction. We're now waiting to bring the, the, uh, the results into the floor of parliament. But it will be done in the context of the 2001 peace agreement. Looking forward to the future, in conclusion, I'm excited about Papua New Guinea. Uh, next year, we celebrate 50 years of our nationhood. We still a robust democracy. We still a free market economy uh, we, all, with all the fragilities, but our potential is second to none. The highest density in as far as Australian investors are concerned is found in Papua New Guinea. You have over 5,000 Australian investors in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea's concentration of visit offshore is Australia. We're here as brothers and sisters nation. For 50 years on, we'll be maturing as a nation, but we still carry our downsides. If you at ANU see in some areas of public policy that needs us to be, to, to be improving on, I can give you one certainty. James Marape and my team of leaders take all the criticisms we can take, and we are not offended by any criticism. So long as you offer alternate solutions, we are ready to listen and work to ensure we fix those problems that we have and, and, and carry through and we make PNG a better place. When PNG becomes a better place, then Australia will live in a better region. It's simple as that. I was telling some of my friends earlier, needless to say who I was uh, speaking with, but if PNG is a failed country, you don't have to worry about boat seekers from a thousand miles off. Canoes will pedal down into Australia. I don't want canoes to pedal down to, to Australia. I would have failed in my lifetime if canoes pedaled down into Australia. I would possibly hang myself uh, insane. And so I'm working very hard, 18 hours a day, to ensure canoes don't come down to Australia. Thank you for helping us out. Speak from ANU context with UPNG. Speak the data and facts that you have. Offer credible alternate solutions if you find some. We're looking forward to work with credible data and solutions to ensure PNG is better, Australia is better, Pacific is secured, and we all coexist for the next 50 years going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Now, is this working? Prime Minister, this is what we call a fireside chat without the fire although your speech certainly raised a number of challenging issues. So back in 2019, you gave your first major speech in Australia as Prime Minister, 
and you spoke of your government as having a core group of young, educated leaders. Clearly, the transformative power of education is dear to your heart. You are, in fact, a product of it. What is your vision for improving educational standards in PNG? And what more can institutions like ANU do? Yeah, we write reports and we criticise positively, uh, but what other practical things can institutions like ours do with institutions like University of Papua New Guinea? Uh, the partnerships that have existed in Australia and PNG, how can we refresh, enhance them so that they meet the needs of the 21st century? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Julie, for the, this question. Education is key, as I was saying earlier. 1984, I hardly connected two English sentences together. Uh, here I am, I've never been school outside, but uh, just a home, home school boy, high school PNG, university PNG, uh, both undergraduate and postgraduate, uh, possibly going towards my PhD. Uh, we just want uh, equality interventions. If ANU can ensure that the equality interventions are inbuilt into the programs you're doing. And in a world today, the today education is much easier with the use of ICT platform. And so online learning, real-time learning, uh, mass learning. PNG right now faces a, a deficiency where actual in-classroom facility is far lesser than the number of students we produce out of our year 12 every year. We had a education reform in 1991 that uh, create, create the converse uh, negative impact. Instead of opening up accessible quality education to our people, our students, it created more dropouts with half-baked education. We created more grade eight dropouts, more grade 10 dropouts, uh, more grade 12 dropouts, and uh, our spaces at the higher education remain static. Uh, in the 1991, we had about 10,000 higher education spaces including UPNG, uh, in 2024, 10,000 spaces still remain as we speak. And so we haven't grown higher education sector. We've just grown our lower education sector with almost uh, uh, a quality that doesn't match them to be skilled uh, people when they come out of grade eight or grade 10 or grade 12. Uh, when I was education minister 10 years ago, I introduced a uh, uh, alternate flexible open learning program. As Prime Minister today, I'm entrancing this to bring those who left off school. There's about five million of them since 91. They've left grade eight, grade 10, grade 12, or even university and colleges who have no work, they're in society. And so empowering them is our immediate interest, but going forward, opening up spaces for schools at different levels is something we want to work on. And uh, Julie, I just think, even at the higher education, uh, down to uh, after year 12, uh, opening up through the use of ICT should bridge the gap for us at the very earliest. If uh, ANU can continue on partnership with us through the ICT platform in opening more specialized education better uh, going forward, as well as your input in our postgraduate uh, qualifications for our teachers who will go back and teach at different levels back home, in my view. The, both mixing quality interventions as well as opening up space for educational accessibility. Prime Minister, one of the strengths of Papua New Guinea is that it has a young and growing population. 50%, uh, I think, of your population is under the age of 25. But that presents massive challenges. What are going to be the jobs of the future for these young people? We understand PNG's current economy, but where can the government uh, diversify in terms of uh, the economy so that there are jobs that uh, match the aspirations of your significant population of young people? Uh, thank you, Jolie. The six mining and oil and gas project I've mentioned would not create a million jobs. The highest they would create possibly uh, 10,000, 15,000 jobs. And so uh, we understand clearly what we need to do. Uh, we've had a focus on uh, downstream processing as a key conversation for us to move into the industry space. The 
our resources we want at the very earliest instead of exporting raw timber, raw fish, uh, raw agricultural produces, we want to move into the downstream space that hopefully in the next 10 years, if it matures, it should create a new stream of job that is quite substantial. But at the very earliest, we're putting budgeted program for small, medium, and micro businesses for people who own land, by the way. Papua New Guineans who are all sitting here in this class or classes here own land back home. Uh, land is asset. This resource has not been monetized or used properly, so we're encouraging the mess that five million that I spoke earlier, uh, instead of wasting time in the cities uh, or urban areas doing nothing, why don't you go back and link back into agriculture uh, and, and other sustainable uh, pursuits of life. So uh, our immediate focus in the next uh, medium term is to arrest this unengaged population, but midterm as well as uh, long term in the next successive midterms for us, uh, if we can migrate to an uh, industry downstream process, industry base, that will be the multiplier uh, we need for our country. Prime Minister, you mentioned the um, events of January earlier this year where uh, there was a period of violent unrest. Uh, you were commended for your swift response in declaring a state of emergency. You provided a, a package of support for businesses affected by the violence. You also undertook to carry out an investigation into the root causes of the social unrest. What has been the result of that investigation? Early, early days, I appreciate. But do you believe that lack of work opportunities was one of those causes? And what can the government do about that? Well, the trigger point was the police in the city not turning up to work. And that, when that became the trigger point, uh, again, I'm at the mercy of the full conclusion of the investigation that is going on. I'm not... Uh, I, I don't have the... Uh, full basis to uh, indicate what the report has found. We're very soon coming across. Uh, uh, PNC is an interesting place. It's a very interesting place. Those who want to gain office in a couple of times in a nation's history have resorted to lawlessness. And, uh, and on, on, on the event, on tent, they just need a trigger. A trigger, and the trigger was that, and uh, certain parts of a city went uh, to looting. Uh, our, 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 our shops. We're giving incentives, we're giving assistance to those who are tax-paying businesses who lost out, uh, and uh, those assessments will be completed very, very soon. But the good news, and you sort of gave credit to me in saying that we uh, took immediate measures, I want to pass it back to the super majority of our people. That one night and one day in the 24 hours the entire city of Port Mosby that houses almost a million people, police was not at work. The destruction we face was not even more than 10%. 95% of our city was secured by the people themselves. So it is not James Marape that restored peace in Port Mosby. Super majority of my people maintained peace in the city when police in one night decided not to work in Port Mosby. So credit must go to my people, the greater majority, even in the midst of their own poverty. They never went out on a ransack in over 500 stores in Port Mosby. Less than 20 stores were attacked. Indications linked towards a little bit of organization beyond, behind what happened. We, we will leave no stones unturned. Uh, police, we're calling for a, a greater commissioner inquiry into the entire police structure. We're getting a judge to head that inquiry. And those police who decide not to be loyal to allegiance to the state will lose their job, as I speak. Prime Minister, again in 2019, uh, you spoke at the Lowy Institute. And I recall you said at that time that PNG was a nation at the crossroads. Uh, you mentioned that next year, it'll be 50 years since independence. And one of the challenges that uh, PNG has always faced has been service delivery to the remote areas, the 830 tribes and language groups. Looking back now and looking forward, 
How do you think PNG is going to tackle that challenge? I mean, it is a strength that you have one of the most diverse populations in the world, but it's also an immense challenge for you. How do you think uh, you've progressed and would you still describe PNG as a nation at the crossroads? We're still at the crossroads, uh, but uh, you know we have structures in place. The challenge I have with my cabinet is to increase efficiency in those structures and uh, step up on accountability. And uh, we, we're putting the necessary steps in place. Uh, part of the gift uh, we want to give to our nation at 2025 is a refurbished and uh, improved public service structure that delivers to our people. The current structure we have is workable if we can I increase on efficiency. Uh, that is why, for me, I could not have compromised on Independent Commission Against Corruption. We're trying to set up a national monitoring authority uh, that will be also uh, assisted by uh, the independent stakeholders in our community, including civil society. And so that arm's length check on what governments do at different levels. The structure we have is workable for us right now, in my view. The District Development Authority, structure, the, the structure, the provincial governments, and our national government. So uh, we've got a planning minister sitting here, part of the job he will tidy. He's clearly defining the various functions and responsibilities on the different structures. To address the diversity of people we have, districts become important conduits of service delivery. Many accuse us on the way in which we uh, transfer money from the national government to the sub-national governments. But uh, uh, Julie, it's a quicker, easier way to get, get money out from the cumbersome centralized system that is based in Waigani to, straight to the point of service delivery to the districts and to the province. Now, if we can get them to be fired up, uh, then they save their own local community better. Uh, as Prime Minister, I'm not everywhere all over the country. Uh, ministers uh, are not all over the country in a, in a system that has eroded in efficiency over the last uh, 49 years. Uh, if we can get it right, cleaning up the entire structure of public service delivery, making districts functional with accountability built in, making provinces responsive. Uh, the reason why we have provincial governments in our country is to embrace the diversity of people we have. The government expectations in an island province is different from an highlands province, or uh, uh, different regions of our country for that matter. So the structure we have in as far as government and arms of service delivery is good. All I must do now with my, my team of leadership is to ensure we increase efficiency, building accountability mechanisms, and get the funds to them, and hopefully they deliver to intention. I tell all my taxpayers, if a district is not working, report the district to Ombudsman. Now we've given you ICAC and you've got police. So if the trinity of law enforcement is being reported about, I don't think anyone will stand a chance of uh, trying to play hide and seek. So we've thrown in ICAC into the fray. This integrity officer there, if in between now and 2025, 2026, and in this term of parliament, we tidy the service delivery mechanisms, I expect a better outcome. Uh, if not in this decade, then in the next next decade, PNG should be a better place to live in and do business. Prime Minister, PNG is a nation blessed with resources, natural resources, and you spoke of uh, the increased returns from resource development. Uh, you spoke of taking equity positions in development projects. Uh, and you speak very eloquently about foreign direct investment, which of course uh, is just central to Australia's success as an economy, uh, foreign direct investment. Yet uh, PNG's approach has been criticised as resource nationalisation. Uh, some uh, critics have gone so far as to say it presents a greater sovereign risk. Uh, how do you address or how do you balance the state-owned enterprise approach with the foreign direct investment that we all know is needed for large projects that drive economic growth and prosperity? Well, since I pronounced uh, uh, our, our government's intention on May 30th, 2019, uh, we look back retrospectively from 2024, we've had Newmont, the biggest mining company, coming to the economy. We have Barrick, 
the second biggest gold company, still maintaining presence in PNG, and a first for them. Globally, they don't own minority share in mines they operate. Today, they own 49% in a mine they operate, uh, continually maintaining presence in PNG. We have two super majors in Total and ExxonMobil in PNG. We have Santos in PNG. We have Telstra in PNG, the biggest telco company in our part of the world. Uh, so having big companies in PNG is a testament that yes, the headlines may sound different, but we know our commercial numbers. There's a deal space. You make a return on investment, we make a return on investment. Uh, we know the hard place to do business. We are democracy. We believe in free market cap cap capitalism. You come into our country, we look after you. You make a return on investment. Today, we're far different than what it was in the 70s and 80s. We, re we read numbers much, much better than where we were reading in the 70s and 80s. So the big majors are in our country. If the majors are in our country, I encourage all the miners. Something must be happening right for the majors to be in PNC. Two big mining companies, globally speaking, two big hydrocarbon industry companies, globally speaking. The big four is in PNC. Take that, critics. Um, <laughs> Prime Minister, one of the great challenges in our region is the great power competition between the United States and China, and it's playing out in uh, the Indo-Pacific, perhaps more um, intensely than anywhere else. Uh, as you've heard many times, Australia has always sought to balance our relationship with China, our largest two-way trading partner, and our relationship with the United States, our um, ally, a strategic defence, intelligence and investment partner. I know that PNG, like other nations, face uh, the challenge of managing and trying to get that balance right. What do you think the future holds there? How, how do you see PNG managing what we all call the great power competition um, between those two powerful nations? Well, Julie, we have not gone anywhere else. Last time I was in the US, someone asked me, what do you think about China? And I said, I'm in the same place you were in 1976. In 1976, President Nixon had a good relationship with Beijing. PNG had a good relationship with Beijing. We're in the same place, and they may have done some revolutions. And so we have not gone anywhere else, and we will not go anywhere else. But having said this, we will not compromise. Uh, certain values we hold dear, and that's democracy, and China respects us for this. We deal transparently with them. When, we, when I was in Beijing a few months ago, lucky for me, I was earlier than uh, Prime Minister Albanese. A few months later, uh, uh, President Xi Jinping and President Biden had a wonderful bilateral, a four hours bilateral, much longer than my one hour bilateral with President Xi Jinping. They had it a few weeks later, after I visited Beijing. Uh, PNG knows our place in the Pacific and the world very well. We will not compromise our relations with China just as much as we will not compromise our relations with USA. Uh, we subscribe whilst we are friends to all enemies to none. We also believe that someone else's enemy is not my enemy. Uh, we maintain good relations with all nations in that context. And only time we will think and give a second thought is when our values are on the crossroad and our values are to be compromised. If they respect our values, we respect their values. Uh, some things are deeper. Uh, certain things that are 5,000 years old cannot be changed by one prime minister. It takes time and process to work through. And so for PNG and Australia in the context of where we are, we export big into China and the Asian market. The next 100 years is almost the Asian century as the last 100 years was Western century, more so the European century. And so we can't ignore the fact that market is opening big, not just in China, but Southeast Asia, India, West Asia. These markets need to be tapped. And for PNG, as a nation needing economic sustenance, I cannot compromise market unless another market opens big time for me. And so right now, my market cannot be compromised in dogmas and political worldviews. I remain uh, and maintain my friendship with all nations. Uh, for China, we give them respect. They totally respect our security arrangements with the USA, our security arrangements with, with Australia, and uh, they give us full respect in that context. 
When I went into Beijing, they stayed clear of security conversations. Uh, they honored us in the economic space. That's simply because we were transparent with them. We don't play nations against each other. We tell them what we're all about, and we relate to them. And for PNG, word is a bond. Melanesian society, word is bond for us. Writing was introduced later. <laughs> we give you our word, we honor our word. And so Chinese know our word with them, and Australia and the US knows our word with them. In as much as our humble and little role is concerned, we pray for peace. We work for peace. We work for tolerance of diversity. The only time we come into the conversation is when human right is abused. Prime Minister, I have so many questions to ask you, but I'm going to narrow it down to two more, if you'll forgive me, and I'll be really quick. First, uh, the Australian PNG Economic Partnership. Uh, clearly, part of that envisages um, access to the Australian labour market. Uh, there is the Australian Pacific Engagement Visa. If a, particularly young Papua New Guineans were to come to Australia for um, skills training and uh, entry into the labour market, what is it that you would want us to provide them so that when they come back to PNG, they can make a significant contribution uh, to your economic development? Uh, Julie, thank you for raising this. We had a good conversation with uh, Prime Minister Albanese, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles in, in the office. Uh, much of the conversation also centers in uh, progressing the CISAP signed with the Liberal government as well as the, the bilateral security agreement we've signed. Uh, I am happy Australia is now opening up a specific visa pathway for Pacific Islanders to work in Australia. Uh, that, in my view, is, is timely. Papua New Guinea, by the way, is 90% of Pacific by population size, by land size, and by economy. Uh, and uh, my brother Pat uh, understands this very well, but we don't intend to cloud out the space for our smaller brothers and sisters in Pacific. They need more employment as much as we need employment. Uh, please give them their share and their quarter of access to Australia. Uh, we are your uh, immediate precinct. We are your immediate neighbor. Accessibility, uh, not, uh, when I say we, meaning the Pacific. And so I advocate for them in uh, all conversations. I speak for the entire Pacific Island nation. So. Uh, give them as much accessibility to Australia in as much as possible. In the context of PNG, uh, it's a two-way conversation when we talk about uh, tidying the border security arrangements and the visa requirements. Uh, we want to elevate our own, own, uh, own uh, quality of visa data and visa systems to the level you have with New Zealand so that easy access by Australians to PNG and PNG to Australia can take place. Australia remains the biggest place of PNG visits, as well as PNG remains the biggest place of Australian visits, especially by investors. So the free flow of moving in and out of Australia PNG must be reached at the very earliest. We intend to make that pronouncement better as part of our 50th anniversary uh, announcements. But deep inside, the, uh, coming back to your issue uh, on, on people coming to work and study here, those that come under the under the auspices of uh, the seasonal work uh, program, uh, we don't want just to be stopped at that level. We want them to also be placed into specifically targeted training in in uh, vocational and TAFE and, and technical schools here, as well as uh, higher education learning also here. If they could also move on into study, get, gain additional skills, and if you need them here, you can pick them up. Otherwise, we take them back home they can get engaged in SME and other needs we have. I don't know what you uh, uh, what you see, but when I look into the future, I see your population stagnant at around 30 million. I see my population catching up with you. Yeah, I get it. And so, it, so and and so in that context, but you have a you have a very uh, A plus economy. Uh, you need uh, blue collar workmen and women to support your economy. Uh, Papua New Guinea speaks your English. Papua New Guinea has the same worldview as you have in respect to democracy and Christianity and others. Uh, we can fill in the gap in as far as your labor gap is concerned. And we're just speaking deeply into how we could fill in the space, uh, not just in trade and skill, also in defense and other work opportunities in Australia. So that conversation is standing up very well. I keep on reminding Australia that we, you, you bettered us, so if you need help, we're here to help you too. And that goes to supplying you also with additional workforce, but 
not just quick on the job seasonal workforce arrangements, but more importantly, training our citizens to be skilled to work here as well as work back in, in our economy, our country. Now, Prime Minister, you know, and Minister Conroy knows, that we cannot have a conversation with a PNG leader without raising sport. And I recall my first visit to Papua New Guinea, Port Moresby, when I was in opposition. And we arrived in the morning and everyone, and I mean literally, not figuratively, literally, everyone at the airport was wearing a maroon jersey, Guernsey. What are we going Jersey, okay, they're wearing them around from the little ones. So they are, I think I saw one or two blue ones. And I said, I think it was Fixie, I think you were there at the time. The High Commissioner now was in PNG at the time. And I said, why is everybody wearing, why is everybody wearing a maroon jersey? And they said, oh, it's state of origin last night. Like, duh, state of origin. Now, you have a magnificent team, the PNG Hunters, currently playing in the Queensland Rugby League comp. How important is it? to PNG for the hunters to be in the national uh, competition here because the one unifying force in PNG amongst all others the one unifying force is sport so how's it going how's it looking 2026 what do you think yeah without stealing the thunder from Pat Conroy <laughs> <laughs> oh I just did did I uh, but I just want to say uh, it's our, our national unity strategy uh, it's not just sport for us. The other bits for NRL will come from a sports and commerce business perspective for us has a deep intrinsic national unity perspective in a land of many divides, including ethnicity, tribe, language, and politics. Uh, one thing that can unite is sport. And uh, rugby league is the common uh, sports we have in PNG right now, although we have other sports, rugby union, Aussie rules, basketball and every other sport, but uh, rugby league is a dominant sport. Uh, and, and so having a team in national rugby league competition for us will be a force to unite a nation that is so diverse. And so in the strategy, our bid is uh, more serious. It is a compelling case, but we will not override uh, the, the, the natural process of the bid. It has to have a business case and the business case has been worked upon so that it sustains on its own merit without using politics and government as a conduit to have access to a team. So we're doing what we can to ensure that the uh, bid is sustainable and bid is, uh, is competitive in the face of other bids. But uh, again, it's a national unity strategy. If Nelson Mandela could have used the invis Invincibles mm. and look, last year they won fought in as many years the Fort World Cup in, the, in a nation of many contests and many ones a rugby union continues to anchor South Africa. Uh, for us, in a land of the most diverse nation, we thought rugby league can unite our nation. So it's a good good, good intention at the end of this Well, room. Prime Minister, for what it's worth, I'm backing the Hunters. Absolutely, I'm All backing right. your bid. It might be another name. You might be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> um, uh, we might give a name that is to attract Australian support as well. So I'm just letting... Uh, so my mind is racing. Uh, you know, we, we have rich history that runs from 1906 yeah. all the way right up until today. So there's big moments in which we were together. And we'll pick one of the names that is associated with the big, one of the big moments. I love where your mind is going. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have been privileged this evening to hear from the very eloquent leader of Papua New Guinea, a very dear friend to many of us here. Uh, we are absolutely delighted that with your distinguished delegation, you chose to visit ANU, accept our invitation to address us. You spoke of the many challenges, the many opportunities, the shared history, and you are quite a student of the Australian Papua New Guinean history. Uh, but optimistically, you spoke of a future for Papua New Guinea as a natural leader in the region, as a strong and dynamic nation that can provide opportunities for the many magnificent people who are citizens of your great country. Australia is uh, your very best friend. Uh, there is so much warmth and love and affection between Australians and Papua New Guineans. Maybe we take each other for granted from time to time. And, and I just hope that 
generations who weren't around in 1975 or 1945, I hope that they understand the depth and breadth of this truly unique and very special relationship. And Prime Minister, you are an exemplar for us all in the way you uh, articulate this very special relationship. We thank you for your time here and we wish you and Madame Marape and your delegation a very safe journey home, but don't go too soon. We would like you to join us for uh, drinks outside and let's hope everybody gets an opportunity to meet the Prime Minister. And just one last point on the book. Genevieve found our old visitor's book ANU introduced back in the 1950s, and there are some amazing names in there. Then it got lost in 1984. Bob Hawkes is the last signature in the book. And so now Prime Minister Marape has reignited that visitor's book and has signed it so graciously. So please thank Prime Minister James Marape. Thank you, thank you, thank you.